Good morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you, first panel, for those brilliant opening uh, arrays of comments. So I am going to be talking about the lyric from the point of view of its deep history um, to start us off and then we'll move from there. Um, the lyric, as, as Anne mentioned, is how we name poems uh, usually shorter rather than longer, which are of personal feeling, personal relationship to every kind of experience, interior, discovery, expression, investigation. Uh, as a hand offers us a way to touch, hold, and question the outer world, the lyric gives us a way to touch, hold, and question our ideas, values, griefs, hopes, longings, all that is also inner. The lyric is also always language infused by and changed by its own music. It works by music's pleasures and by music's alterations. In the West, it's named after the lyre. In many other culture, the word for lyric simply translates as song. And so far as we know, these poems were originally accompanied by drum, koto, flute, hand, some sound. The work of the lyric is in part memorability. It is a way to keep in place by musical patterns and fabulously intensively interesting words what might otherwise escape holding. Often the heart of lyric is something so volatile we cannot remember it without the poem that creates it and recreates it. Like music itself, the work of lyric is also the enactment of transformation. A song is not one note repeated over and over. Over its course, something happens, we are left changed. In every culture, poetry's birth story is connected to the trickster. Uh, in Greek culture, as a one-day-old infant, Hermes breaks every rule. He kills a tortoise, he steals Apollo's cows, he kills a couple of them, he uses the intestines to string the first lyre, and then his first song is something he uses to trade the furious Apollo, the lyre, in exchange for the 48 remaining cattle. Um, lyric poems change the deal and the condition of the status quo. They do this from their beginning. They have always done it. We may feel the lyric as heartfelt outpourings, but they do other work as well. And part of that is because of what musical awareness does to our minds. They are ingenious, they are subtle, they are a way to outsmart the gods, and they are a way to outsmart ourselves. Writing a lyric, reading a lyric makes us more capacious and subtle. They trick us into knowing more than we know, feeling more than we knew we felt. And over time, the lyric poem itself has become larger. If you trace its history, it has over time taken in more and more as its subject. I have not myself found any lyric poem that talks about entering into fatherhood earlier than the generation which produced Galway Cannell talking about the birth of his two children. Lyrics expand. But since I'm mostly covering the deep history, I'm going to give you my personal speculation about where lyric came from. And since it's pre-literacy, we don't actually know I am making this up. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I believe that because their job is not only to allow us to bear our feelings and our lives, but also to create the technologies of shift and liberation to transform us from one condition of being to the other, I thought, what are these fundamental transformations that Lyric would start with? First, lullaby. What guides an infant from the terror of non-existence and powerlessness into the reassurance of a safety space held sleep? Work songs, bringing many people's labor into unified and amplified power. Uh, what is a poem but an amplification of our powers? Alas, war songs, a trance that creates fearlessness, that creates joined coherence of shared identity and purpose. Love songs, the seductions and courtship accomplished by beautiful display. Prayer, 
which is also often a kind of seduction, both the prayers of praise and wonder, but also the prayers by which frail human beings attempt to bend into a personal ally the unknowable power of a world which is in fact beyond any controlling. And the last of my speculations of the beginning of the lyric, mourning, lamentation, threnody, elegy, the musical pact we make with time, loss, and grief. It is a kind of honoring backward, which like rowing a rowboat where you face backward, moves us forward, takes the singer forward into an agreement of future and continu continuing life. There are other kinds of poems historical epics, uh, Lucretius's Deorum Natura, you know, how do you remember the facts of science by putting it into rhyme and meter. The most recent such poem was Darwin's grandfather Erasmus wrote the last scientific paper that was written in, in pattern and verse. Um, the lineage of the actions and the historical record of kings, all these things. Lyric has a different feel and stance. And stance. It is personal, subjective, fingerprinted with an individual life. Lyric poems of political <clears throat> witness are poems because music is part of their meaning and making. They are lyric poems because they are acts of witness seen through two eyes and one body, voiced by one recognizable tongue. A crowd chant of transformation may rhyme but a poem comes from what one life is known and how it is felt and seen by one person who cannot help but respond. Conversely and perhaps paradoxically, the most private personal lyric speaks to the life of all of us who are shared. I read Kavafi, Catullus, Onono Kamachi, and I find in their words and recognize in their words my own life. There are boundaries to the lyric I don't much care about naming or making them. Is a folk song a lyric? Is a hymn a lyric? I, I don't care. Um, you know, I do think that a lyric poem is probably a poem that carries in some way the mark and stamp of the particular individual and perishable life. It has the timbre of voice and the slant of vision. It has this moment's news, this moment's solace, this moment's guide into desperately needed transformation. We can't help but hear when we, when we read or listen to Keats's Ode to Autumn, also the trace of a single person's passage through its existence, which is as moving to me as the 3.7 million year old footsteps, footprints in the, soul, in the soil of Tanzania by the woman we have come to name Lucy, our earliest mother. Before I pass the baton, I want to give a few examples of some of the oldest poems we have from several traditions. Here's one 3,500 years old from dynastic Egypt in a translation by Ezra Pound and Noel Stock. I find my love fishing, his feet in the shallows. We have breakfast together and drink beer. I offer him the magic of my thighs. He is caught in the spell. <laughs> This one is relatively late. It's from 850 Common Era, but it stands at the beginning, very close to the beginning of the written poetic tradition in Japan, uh, written by Onono Komachi, a poet who in the Japanese tradition is very much like Sappho is in the Western tradition. How invisibly it changes color in this world, the flower of the human heart. Here's Meliager, a poet of first century BCE Greece. Like a child who still in his mother's lap toys with dice in the morning, you, Eros, have played my life away. <laughs> this one is from uh, the Prakit language of India, second century, translated by Arvind Krishna Marotra. The way he stared I kept covering myself, not that I wanted him to look elsewhere. <laughs> okay, so those were all love poems. I'm gonna give you a couple, couple different ones. Um, this is a 6,000 year old poem from ancient Sumer. 
The gods admire this earth. I am red with its dust. Early feminist poem by a 6th century BCE woman, Sumangala Mata, who was one of the first women to join um, the Buddhist assemblage of, of early nuns. At last, oh, her, her husband made umbrellas. At last free, at last I am a woman free, no more tied to the kitchen, stained amid the stained pots, no more bound to the husband who thought me less than the shade he wove with his hands. No more anger, no more hunger. I sit now in the shade of my own tree. Sitting, breathing, happy, my heart is serene. And you can feel this woman <laughs> kicking off the chains of her servitude <laughs> into liberation, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this last poem I'm going to read you, I don't know the date of, it's one of the anonymous Chinese figures translated by, by W.S. Merwin. Heart like 15 water buckets, seven rising, eight going down. <laughs> These are origin lyrics, early born. I find them lasting, contemporary, and thrilling. I am going to leap forward in time <laughs> and uh, concentrate on the, med frankly, concentrate on the obvious um, because, and uh, I, which means I'm going to leap to the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance and around the Mediterranean and then I'm going to leap a little further forward and allow Mark to take care of now. Okay, well, we um, he's, 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 um, I, I, and I'm going to again take the obvious, the sort of, that, that, that exemplary uh, lyric form that may be the first that, 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 that springs to mind when, when, when we think of lyric poetry, which is in the Western tradition, the sonnet, um, an invention of a very interesting um, origin. There was, in 13th century Sicily, a court presided over by Frederick II, Holy Roman Emperor and King of Sicily, who was a remarkable man and Catholic in that ordinary sense in his tastes and without limit in his curiosity. He assembled uh, Arabic mathematicians, Jewish, philosophers and physicians. He assembled people from all over the world he was possible to reach. He was a patron of the sciences. He was a patron of the arts. Uh, he uh, was an obsessive falconer when he wasn't leading a crusade. And he led the only one that did not turn into a bloodbath, a very interesting man, um, or fighting other kinds of wars. He was out with his falcons and writing for decades his um, guide, uh, uh, The Art of Falconry. But in his court was a notary among the people attendant upon him named um, Giacomo D'Alentini, who adapted a Provençal form and produced a 14th line poem, which has made a big difference um, in uh, the West. Um, that was a form picked up by Dante, Cavalcante, Petrarch, who canonized a set of subjects as well. And love um, is something uh, deeply uh, embedded in the tradition. Erotic love that must be impeded, crucial to this love and its function in the lyric poem, is that uh, you've, it's got to be frustrated by something. The lady is indifferent. The lady is already possessed by somebody else. Best of all, um, as, as, as both Dante and Petrarch discovers, the lady dies. It's great. It makes her... <laughs> 
it makes her extremely useful <laughs> as um, an agent of higher longing. Um, and I want to just read to you an example from, this is sort of canonical, again, I'm going way for the obvious here. This is um, a, a, a prose translation of Petrarch's um, the number 190 of the Rime Sparse, or Scattered Rhymes, uh, one of his, probably his most famous sonnet. And here's, here's the prose version. Um, a white doe on the green grass appeared to me, with two golden horns between two rivers in the shade of a laurel when the sun was rising in the unripe season. Her look was so sweet and proud that to follow her I left every task like the miser who, as he seeks treasure, sweetens his trouble with delight. Let no one touch me, she bore written with diamonds and topazes around her lovely neck. It has pleased Caesar to set me free. And the sun had already turned at midday. My eyes were tired by looking but not sated. When I fell into the water and she disappeared. Um, there is a world of things to say about that poem even coming to us without the gorgeous music and intricate form of the Italian, the original Italian. But um, it, uh, it has been a, a, a touchstone for many as they've thought about the lyric, the meditative, the contemplative, something remembered, narrated in the past tense, but inhabited emotionally, spiritually, in the present, something irrevocably lost, but so precious that the poet needs to contrive a way to imagine having that loss all over again, which is as close as we come to possession. Um, and uh, this links, of course, to uh, to what Jane was saying about temporality too. I think the foundational business of the lyric poem is to give us just fleetingly, maybe a few times in our life, whether we're writing or reading, the impression of having been here, mm -hmm. of having inhabited the present tense, which does not exist. By the time I name it, it's gone. If I try to look forward to it, it's not yet here. But so that the best we can have is the sense that it wasn't wholly lost on me. There was a moment, there was a moment I felt I had been there. Um, the inwardness, of course, the, the, the centering on a longing that is deeply private is um, part of this inheritance. And yet, of course, there's always that paradox about the lyric. If it were merely private, it wouldn't need to be a poem. It wouldn't be shared. It wouldn't be something that can move the rest of us. So there's always a doubleness to it. And surely that longing for speech, which imagines a hearer, in this instance, not a hearer in particular, not an inner audience, um, but nevertheless, it is the longing to not have been here alone. Um, something happened when this form got imported into English, which is the tradition that made many of us in this room. Um, it's my mother tongue. It's the only tongue I'm actually competent in, and I worry about that competency a lot every day. Um, but I want to, uh, Surrey and Wyatt, the 16th century English poets, translated. The sonnet in English was born through translation, um, and I want, let's 
pay tribute to the translators among us because that has to continue. And I want you to hear a difference because one of the things that has been occupying my mind lately is the thought of, because we inherit this understanding of the lyric as private, as inward, as deriving from a source that, um, that, that, that requires, in fact, solitude, I've become contrarily fascinated with the lyric as a form of social speaking. Here is Wyatt's adaptate translation, you judge, of Petrarch's 190. Whoso list to hunt, I know where is an end. But as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore, I am of them that farthest cometh behind. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she fleeth afore, fainting I follow, I leave off, therefore, sithens in a net I seek to hold the wind. Who list her hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain. And graven with diamonds, in letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about. Noli me tongere, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. There's a lot to be said about the difference between belonging to Caesar and having been set free by Caesar. But what I want to focus on for the moment is that this is not the same kind of speech. This is the other end of the spectrum. This is not meditative. This is not inward. This does not depend on um, a, 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 a misty audience. This has, it, it's unstable, its rhetorical position, which is just the rhetoric just being like me talking to you. It's just like the betweenness of language. Um, it's unstable, but uh, included in that instability are definite moments when I think of it as like Wyatt's locker room poem. I mean, it's just, it's the guys. You want to, it's, I mean, he could be like write, writing her phone number on a telephone booth if it were 30 years ago, or posting something like on the internet. Um, it's a, a sort of, he's complaining, he's pissed off, he's aggrieved, and he's aggrieved at her. And he's also, he's imagining, he's also one among many, he's in the game. And it's not absolute loss, it's not not having her. It's that he's coming farthest behind. He's not even up there at the front of the pack. And I just, and so, and that transformation, I mean, that to me is a wild transformation. Wild. And it made possible all of Shakespeare, for example. <laughs> um, that play, that incredible, it made rhetorical manipulation, the who's speaking to whom part, absolutely one of the central instruments of lyric, and therefore it's social life, and therefore a different kind of savvy, now you have me, now you don't, um, now I'm going to get general and abstract or even philosophical, but I've got to dig, you know, at somebody who's pissed me off and made me, f reduced me to being philosophical. So it's um, that, that and, 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 and I, you know, we were talk that we were hearing on the previous panel about the wonderful array of techniques and strategies um, and formal improvisations available to the lyric. And I guess I wanted to point to one moment where it, it actually takes the top of my head off that I'm not saying it's better than Petrarch, God forbid, but it was, as innovation goes, it was, it was wild. It came as though out of nowhere and, uh, and it changed us. Wow. We just heard the, the most uh, spectacular foundation for talking about um, lyric in our time. And, and just because of that sonnet, I wasn't going to do this, but here is one from the last century, uh, which I happen to have with me. Uh, it's by Gwendolyn Brooks. It's called The Rights for Cousin Vit. 
carried her unprotesting out the door, kicked back the casket stand, but it can't hold her, that stuff and satin aiming to enfold her, the lids contrition nor the bolts before. Oh, oh, too much. Too much. Even now, surmise she rises in the sunshine. There she goes, back to the bars she knew and the repose in love rooms and the things in people's eyes. Too vital and too squeaking. Must emerge. Even now, she does the snake hips with a hiss. Slops the bad wine across her shan tongue. Talks of pregnancy, guitars, and bridge work. Walks in parks or alleys. Comes happily on the verge of happiness. Happily hysterics. Is. Yes. <laughs> no. Okay, yeah. so, yeah, yeah, so yeah. we arrive at, at a sonnet where the turn happens in the last word, which is also the last sentence, is. What an extraordinary yeah, place yeah, yeah, to get yeah, to, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. That, that also, you could argue, goes right out of there, right? The willingness to bend the rhetoric, turn the form, uh, to, to, in public, complain about the dead, try to sort out one's feelings about them, and find oneself approving their incredible yeah, yeah, yeah. vitality, even though it's, it's kind of messy. She wine in her shen tongue, and, and the speaker doesn't quite know what to think about that, but she is alive. She is, despite. So I would guess that the poet did not know where she would arrive, that that affirmation in its single sentence comes bursting out of the act of writing the poem, the, the lyric as a process of sorting something out Absolutely. of a kind of internal Absolutely. argument, which is taking place in front of the reader, as it were. Um, the way, you know, when you're upset about something, you walk down the street muttering to yourself. Hmm? You continue a conversation long after. What you should have said, what you might think now, is a kind of model of a lyric form in some ways. Okay, so um, th this is a, a little bit of, of what one might think of as sort of um, ecstatic criticism. Uh, and it, its model is uh, the late Alan Grossman, incredible thinker, if you don't know his work. There's a book called The Sighted Singer, S-I-G-H-T-E-D, -E this kind of sight, uh, which includes a long piece of his called the Summa Lyrica, which is one of the most brilliant and peculiar meditations on what lyric poetry is that I know. I recommend it highly. Um, and, and he proceeds by making the grandest pronouncements and then attempting to convince you he might be right for a moment. So this is a little like that. Perhaps poetry's accomplishment, the signature characteristic of our art, the thing it does better than anything else, is the representation of subjectivity. Through an alchemical process, not entirely, oh, oh, let me back up, okay. Did <laughs> 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 you nervous reading this thing, okay. Somehow, through an, entire, through an alchemical process, perhaps not entirely explicable, a poem can make us feel that we've been brought very close to the core of another. And in the moment of that spell, we feel a kind of transmission from self to self has taken place, something language and love long for. It avails not, Whitman says in Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. Distance avails not, I am with you. And it's true, the poet is present in 1856 and 2015, present for the reader on West 13th Street and the reader in Reykjavik. The poem inscribes an attentive presence in the world, and its act of attention, once launched, does not stop until there are no more readers. Certainly every ounce of skill, every strategy of shaping tone, syntax, and sound, rhythm and figurative speech has gone into the formation of this extraordinary text, but they can't quite explain its power. You can learn everything in the world about plumbing and still not be able to reproduce the fountains of Rome. There is something at work besides skill, and I'd suggest that something is a distilled sense of human presence. Somebody said this. I can emphasize each word of that little sentence and come closer to being clear about my meaning. Somebody says this, a particular person, as Jane suggested in her definition of the lyric. Somebody says this, the poem's a voiced act, even if that voice lives only in ink now. Somebody says this, these exact words, only in this order. Lyric poetry is a means of writing the self into existence. We say how we see, how we know, we work through whatever means, direct or oblique, to sing myself. Perhaps the how of myself, the style of my perceiving, the manner of my speaking. Lyric poetry is one of the primary domains of selfhood, even if the poem in question never includes an I. The speaker doesn't always need to identify herself with a pronoun, since an individual perceiver is already implicit in the invocation of a moment, the evocation of an instant of time saturated in feeling. And there to go to Linda's definition. That moment of being fully in the present, awake to it, may be one that actually transpires in the writing of the poem when we relive the present 
live the present that is not present, but become such in the act of composing, perhaps live more fully, more deeply, more completely, as it is written than as it passes. Now here, for instance, this is the first stanza of a poem by Christopher Gilbert. And let me show you Chris Gilbert's book. It's kind of an extraordinary story. Uh, this fellow, who you really cannot see on the cover of the book unless it's very close to you, Christopher <laughs> Gilbert, uh, published a book called uh, Across the Mutual Landscape in the early 80s, won the Walt Whitman Award, uh, given by the Academy. He had a second manuscript, which he never published. He became a social worker, wrote some more poems, died uh, fairly young uh, after simply the publication of that one book. It went under the radar but remained hugely influential to a generation of African-American poets. And now Gray Wolf has brought this book back into print, and I recommend it highly. So here is the first stanza of a poem of his. A dog's bark breaks the December 10 degree weather, a bitter dark space bleaching into a voweled ache that staccatos the thin wind, fuzzes into consciousness as a hurt. That's one sentence, we'll try it again. A dog's bark breaks the December 10 degree weather, a bitter dark space bleaching into a voweled ache that staccatos the thin wind, fuzzes into consciousness as a hurt. What's remarkable about that little scene is how totally saturated in feeling it is. And the way that feeling is so clearly evoked without overtly attaching it to a person or an occasion, it's the way the world is at that moment. And the wounding character of the hour is rendered for us largely through sound. Bark, dark, ache are the loudest rhymes, but the stanza is full of echoes, as in the chain of K sounds in break, bark, dark. A voweled ache is sheer genius as a description of a desolate sort of barking. And yet, syntactically, it's not tied to the dog. It seems instead in a positive for the weather. And voweled, what an adjective, right? A voweled ache. It seems instead in a positive for the weather, and voweled is followed by another unexpected verb, staccatos. The final line seems not only to describe the moment, the final line is into consciousness as a hurt, but to encapsulate the project of the poem as a whole, into consciousness as a hurt. No I is named here, but how full these lines are with the presence of a speaker who's in awful shape, down in some dark place this winter day embodies for him. It would be hard to miss the fact that in using all his toolkit, all those devices of sound, in making this chiming, intricate, artfully built sentence, the poet is taking pleasure. He might as well be carving an altarpiece or polishing marble. You can feel the gusto with which he has entered into the act of representing despair. W.H. Auden wrote that a poem should be, quote, a verbal earthly paradise, a timeless world of pure play, which gives us delight precisely because of its contrast to our historical existence, with all its insoluble problems and inescapable suffering. So the first project of the lyric is the establishment of paradise. Auden's word timeless is crucial here, since the traditional province of the lyric is the present. In heaven, we know, nothing ever happens. In the lyric moment, love can be radiantly continuous. We may see things as they are, infinite. To die is different than anyone had supposed, and luckier. And as long as men can breathe, this gives life to thee. When past and future, or let's say history and consequence, are introduced, we move into the territory of narrative. And we all know the narrative of paradise, which is expulsion. <laughs> Auden goes on, in the passage I was quoting above, at the same time, we want a poem to be true. And a poet cannot bring us any truth without introducing into his poetry the problematic, the painful, the disorderly, the ugly. Into the paradise represented by music, the poet must introduce hell, or at least purgatory. The lyric is the stage on which these states of mind, for what else are heaven and hell but conditions of being, must meet. The thrilling thing is that there are endless ways to do this. Louise Glick has written that poetry is autobiography stripped of context and commentary. That's a good description of her poems. But what, <laughs> <laughs> but what if you like context and commentary? In truth, she enjoys those things too, at least in some phases of her work. American poetry is distinguished at this moment both by remarkable quality and by the diversity of its makers. Now, consider Jean Valentine's spare Orphic lyrics. Uh, she seems, you know, like she's been breathing the fumes that come out of the cracks in the cave and, and speaks to us. <laughs> Almost all the narrative furniture is stripped away, leaving us with something that feels like pure interiority. Marie Howe's poems are stripped down too, but in the direction of startling clarity of feeling and of scene, as if the poem is reaching for the most revealing moment of human exchange it can find. Placed beside those, Lucy Brock Broido's lush upholstery of velvet and leopard skin, her rare vocabulary floating above the despair whose occasion seems too painful to really touch. And let's put next to those the tall glass of water refreshing Eileen Miles, 
who will say anything, and whose thinly penciled bits of story are there just to lead us to moments of insight, humor, desire, or delight. Those are just four poets who happen to live within a few miles of this room. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. When, just to encourage you to think about uh, the ways in which lyric in our moment offers so many possibilities, and those possibilities largely have to do with the, the extent to which interiority confronts the social landscape. To what degree <clears throat> is our inner life pressurized by our participation in the world? Um, I didn't want to take up more than my share of time when we were heading into this, but I did want to, I too wanted to read something contemporary. Um, and this is a sonnet. I mean, in the sense that sonnet now means, you know, anything that has a whiff of 14 about it. 12, 13. 13. <laughs> or, or sort of divides and halves that aren't entirely equal, like a slightly bigger on the top and slightly lesser on the bottom. Or has a turn, <laughs> the volta, right. you know, we could, but, but actually, I'm going to read two poems, sorry, because the, the sonnet is such a mobile, and, and it, again, it's just an example, it's just an example, I don't recommend we all run out and write sonnets, but it's just an example of how inheritance um, resonates and can be turned. So let's take, just to, for this example of redeploying what had been inherited and, and kind of codified as a love poem by a certain point. I mean, and we won't go, say, Edna St. Vincent Millay, who did these wicked oh. overturnings. Oh. Whoa! To sex. It um, was a great poem. Yeah. So, but, 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 but this is Robert Hayden, Those Winter Sundays, mm -hmm. um, a poem probably all of you know. S but I can't help it. It's too Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? And so the love poem to the dead father, who wasn't wholly lovable and whose acts of love were not recognized in time <laughs> when the father was still alive and there. It becomes a way of, 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 of thinking through and reformulating that <laughs> longing um, for the one who can never be there. In this instance, it's it's the brutalities of daily life. It's, uh, it's, it's the difference between um, available vocabularies in parent and child. It's the child suffering from uh, adverse, um, of having to protect himself against dynamics he doesn't wholly understand. And yet, it's just that, that light, light, touch on the chord of tradition makes so clear what the central business of that poem is. And then I wanted Can to... Can that one first? Yeah, please, um, darling. Think about what Jane's comment about uh, the music as a container of feeling, as something that could marshal or organize emotion. And that's so beautifully done in that first stanza. That, uh, just read the sentence about the... Uh, well, the blue, the, black, yeah, dark. Yeah, the, the I wonderful. mean, oh, the banked... Do you want the whole sentence? You read it. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sundays... Uh, Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then, with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. Yep. Bank, you, know, you hear that? It, it's being built yep. not simply to please us. It's being built to contain that feeling, to give it a, a stage or an arena. And the poem is one that you can't resolve this stuff. You, you can't 
there is no resolution to the dynamic, to the, or the opposition between the father's, what, the father's brutality, the father's roughness, and the father's love. They both are true, and the poem makes a place where they can coexist. Hmm? So that, that, that becomes a container and a means of going Absolutely. forward. And I would, I would, I mean, this picks up on some, a point you made about the Gwendolyn Brooks, that mm. magic poem. The discovery part, the is at the end there. A lyric poem, whatever else it is, is a site of inquiry. It can quack like a poem and flap its wings like a poem and, do, and sort of, you know, make it through the puddles on, like a poem. But if it's reporting on something discovered off the page, it's not a poem. It's a paraphrase. And this is why, what do I know, what do I know? It has exactly. To be it has to be, it's discovered. It's discovered and it's sung. You know? it, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But anyway, then, uh, just one more, um, then I'm, cause, mm, but it, which is about... A, <laughs> About about turning through the, the, the tradition, and this is another all all hail Cave Canem. This is another. Um, this is Jericho Brown, um, and who's who's writing again. This is a sort of it's a fourteen liner, um, so that's its nod. But it it you can see the way it's thinking about. Um, uh, the the, 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 the the stamp of approval, the sort of certificate that mastering traditional forms is meant or to provide um, or has been thought sometimes to provide um, and used as a weapon. This is called the tradition. Aster, nasturtium, delphinium. We thought fingers in the dirt meant it was our dirt learning names in heat, in elements classical philosophers said could change us. Stargazer, foxglove. Summer seemed to bloom against the will of the sun, which news reports claimed flamed hotter on this planet than when our dead fathers wiped sweat from their necks. Cosmos, baby's breath. Men like me and my brothers filmed what we planted for proof we existed before too late. Sped the video to see the blossoms brought in seconds. Colors you expect in poems where the world ends. Everything cut down. John Crawford, Eric Garner, Garner Mike Brown. And <laughs> Jericho. Talk about the pressure of the social space, right? Yeah. 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 And also, and, and the inventory. What is it we love in the world? What is it that the florilegium of the lyric can collect um, under the shadow of too late, mm -hmm. under the shadow of a world about to end? Um, but of course, it's also turning, this is the most public speech. I mean, this is public calling out. But I think you could also feel the, the speaker wishing that those Absolutely. names did not have to enter Absolutely. in as part of what Absolutely. Cut, right? Absolutely. It's, it's amazing that Absolutely. as if they're barreling down on the poem. Yeah. If they want me to say something, because they've been talking. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the Yates quote that uh, if, if it's pure public speech, uh, what he said, rhetoric is the argument we have with others. Poetry is the argument we have with ourselves. And this goes to the discovery aspect of the lyric, that you don't know where you're going to arrive at. You will be surprised into a larger threshold awareness of both your individual particularity and your commonality with others, and that it isn't simply a holding made by music. It is a making make made by music. That poems, the lyric poem, is an expansion of possibility within the self and within the communal space that the poems made public, and even many poems never made public, still affect, mm. change, uh, alter, by their ever having been found. It's a really scary thing that Yates said that, that sort of 
in a way grows out of that one, which is this, all that is personal soon rots unless it is packed in ice or salt. Mm. <laughs> but, you know, and, and what is ice and salt but, but form? What is ice and salt but Yeah, 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 exactly, you know, the way exactly. That the language makes a yes. container for something to last. Yes, and makes us speak differently. Makes us speak in ways we would not find were we not yeah. under the entrancement and spell and surprise of what sound itself spills forward into knowledge. How did Gwendolyn Brooks find is? By sound. Mm -hmm. And then when there is no body of Gwendolyn Brooks, no voice in the world, there is the voice. And there is a real consolation in that scary statement, which is that something that is packed in ice and salt does, does not rot, remains alive. Alive in a very vital way, and that there is an exchange taking place. That poem is speaking to us in this room, this moment, or just did, and will again as we yeah. call it up. Hmm? Absolutely. So we should stop and let this get exactly. Oh yeah. Thank you all so very much. Thank you.